Okay. Um, good. I'll start with the injury situation. Um, so Liam Cooper, last time I said he was going to be ready to play and he trained the day before we had the, the press conference and we thought he was going to be available. And then he had a small little reaction uh, leading up to the match. And we all just felt like it was prudent that he not push himself with the possibility that we could lose him for the remaining days. So I believe now he trained a bit yesterday and I believe <laughs> that after that and now going into this, this next phase that, that he is uh, better and he has less pain and I believe that he will be available for tomorrow, but, but we still have to uh, kind of go through day by day with that. Patrick Bamford is uh, on the pitch doing individual work, hopefully in team training by the end of the week. Uh, and doing fairly well. So again, it's another one that's day to day, but we're we're all monitoring his progress, and we're about on track. So we will see what that that means uh, going forward. But he won't be available for tomorrow, and then yeah, the rest is is uh, all the same. Kyle, okay. thank you. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Uh, the team have been in the bottom three since October. Have you worked with them at all to keep them positive going into the final few games of the season? Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely my way of leading is being positive. Um, we had a talk yesterday. Um, you know, the, what's, what's involved in the moment? Well, in the moment, if you just looked at the nine games since I've been here, I think there's been a lot of good performances. We've picked up points in uh, uh, a lot of matches. Um, I think we've responded in many ways to, to what I'm trying to do with the group. We've stuck together. It hasn't been easy. But, you know, I, I said if this was the ninth game of the season and we went to Arsenal and went a man down and dug a big hole for ourselves and second half we played like that and found a way to get back in the game and almost were able to, to tie the match up, we would have taken it in the ninth game of the season, we would have taken it away as a big positive. But the situation that we're in means that there's stress. And so, you know, we're trying to, to manage that. And we, we have to accept the fact that that we're in this situation and we have to know that we have to stay strong and we have to know that we have to play with no regrets and we have to make sure that we go after it and we, we have to push now to, to do everything we can, which, which the guys have already done. And now on game day, we have to be a combination of pragmatic and clever and do whatever it takes to, to tactically be sharp and clear, and then, yeah, to, to, do, to defend our goal and to find ways to be dangerous. I'm sure you've seen that you've broken the record for most yellow cards in a Premier League season, 96. How important will discipline be to ensure survival? Yeah, so it's the yellow card thing. You might say that because of, of Luke Ayling's situation as well. Let me, let me address Luke's situation. Um, you know, for me, Luke... As, as much as people want to maybe draw stories of whatever they want about what, what the last years have been here at, at Leeds United, I think Luke Ayling, the Luke Ayling story is as, as much a definition of what this club has become as anything. Guys like him and Calvin and Liam and Stewart who came from the championship, who, who learned so much under Marcelo Bielsa and grew and helped this club become a premiership team again. And so, and for me, Luke is the definition of heart, fight, hard work, mentality, dedication. In every way, he, he defines what we want this club to be about. And in one situation, he jeopardizes all of that that he's invested for himself and for the team. And so for me in the moment, of course, I think about the, the fact that it hurts us as a team. But honestly, I think more about Luke, the person and how he has to deal with this moment, and he knows that he has let the team down and that he's not going to be available for these last matches. He's still going to be massively important in terms of making sure that our group is strong and together, and we are with him, right? And, and I said after the match, this is not the time for finger-pointing and blaming. This is the time for sticking together and believing in who we are and what we are. And so that, that's the way I've dealt with it, and I've supported Luke Internally and I will externally as well. He's a massive part of everything that we do here. And I and I hope that our fans and supporters understand that as well. When it comes to the conversation around relegation, do you think the fact that you went five unbeaten before Manchester City and Arsenal has been forgotten about a little bit? No. 
I, internally, I think we're, we know that we still have a good group and that we can manage these situations. And even against a team like Chelsea, we believe we can get a result at home. So, um, you know, it, it, we knew coming, I, we knew coming into these three matches with city arsenal and Chelsea, that it was going to be very, very difficult to pick up points. And so it's proved to be that just like we knew it was. Um, and we still have so much to play for. So our focus is really on controlling every moment and, and being prepared for every moment. So, um, you know, and, and credit to Burnley and Everton. Credit to them. In a difficult moment, they've, they've also fought for their lives and, and done whatever is possible to claw their way back into this situation. And we'll, we'll do the same. Uh, final question just from me. Erling Haaland, a player that you know you've worked with, could be coming to the Premier League. From what you've seen of him, what do you think he could do in the Premier League? Do you think he'd fit in? Yeah, yeah. Erling Holland is destined to be one of the best players in the world. Um, and it's his quality, but it's also his talent. So I wish he were coming back home here to Leeds. This is his birthplace. Um, but I understand the decision for him to go to Man City. Um, it'll be interesting. You know, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an explosive player in transition. And Man City often plays a lot in possession. He can play any style of play. But, but certainly I believe it makes Man City a, one of the, if not the best team in the world, even better. So... Credit to them for for getting that done, and and you know I always wish the best for Erling. He's an incredible uh, human being. Thank you, Adam. Hey Jesse, um, Jamie Shackleton. Do you see him as a natural fit in at right back in the absence of Luke Bailey? It's a it's one of the possibilities. Um, so, you know, Jamie was hurt for a, a, a relatively long stretch since I've been here, but I, I've gotten to know him more and more. I've watched him with the twenty threes. I've, I've also gone back and watched the games that he's played this year and, and, and the moments that he's had on the pitch. So I think he can potentially fit into that, whether we play with four or five. You know, we've also visited the, the, the possibility of playing with one of our center backs in that position and also with Rafinha and Dan James, who did that admirably against, um, in a five against um, Arsenal. So I'm certainly not going to give away what we're going to do, but Jamie is definitely in the mix. And Rafinha looked like he's losing his head at some point during the game. How do you get the best out of him? How do you, how do you do with him? Yeah, I mean, we've first of all, I I like Rafinha's passion and his mentality and his personality and his desire to win and 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 be a great player. He is a fantastic talent. Um, we haven't gotten enough out of him. That's the truth, and so. You know, we've tried to find ways to play with him a little bit wider. We've tried to find ways for him to be in transition moments a little bit more. We've tried to find ways to get him around the goal more. Against these opponents, uh, the best opponents, it's not like we're going to be in the final third for, you know, 50% of the game where we can really get him on the ball. So obviously that means getting him in transition and finding opportunities for getting him around the goal in those moments is, is the way that he can be dangerous. Playing him at wing back then doesn't always provide him the chance to be in those spaces. But, you know, again, we'll, we'll figure out um, how to get him the ball more, how to get him in, in space more, how to get him on the move more so that he can be dangerous and help the team. The moment's goal difference separates you and Burnley. It's quite a big goal difference. Yeah. Uh, ratio. Is there an element of you when you're going into this game against Chelsea, you think, just go for it? Because it doesn't matter if you lose the game 1-0 or 5-0, it's sort of irrelevant. Well, I think being pragmatic always in these matches against best opponents is important, but also finding times to be aggressive, and, and especially at home. Like I, We all know our fans don't want to see us sit in the in the last in our box for 90 minutes. Um, so they want to see us be aggressive. They want to see, they want to bring energy into the game and we want to do that, but we want to be pragmatic in our, in our ability to do that. We don't just want to be careless. We don't want to be reckless. We want to be thoughtful and, and intelligent with our tactical plan and then our ability to be aggressive in the right moments. You know, in, in the man city match, as much as it was a four, four nil and, and a f- uh, not successful on the day, we we manage that part of things pretty well. And so how it fits for every opponent is a little bit different, but certainly, again, we want to be aggressive at the right times, but then also intelligent to not, not open spaces for the opponent. And, and the last one for me, Jesse, uh, motivationally you used a quote from Gandhi, I understand, according to Jack House for the game. Mm-hmm. How much do you do that, and, and why do you feel that's, that's necessary? Does it work? Well, listen, inspiration is a big part of this job. 
and when you lead people, you have to find ways to have your finger on the pulse of exactly what's happening at any moment. I have 52 articles, right? Little or, or excerpts from books that I sometimes give players when individually I think they need something that to motivate them based on where they are in their development path or who they are as people and how to reach them a little bit differently than just the conversations I have with them. And then I have hundreds of quotes um, that I use at different moments that I try to think about how they fit with who I am and the way we try to play football and how it might fit in a scenario with, with where we are in a season, in a moment, in a time, whatever. Um, and I love, I love quotes. I love learning from people of the past, sports figures, historical figures, whatever. Um, and I think the key is the understanding exactly what messages to use at the right time so that players understand exactly how to handle moments. And here we are, you know, in these, in the stress of relegation, trying to stay strong with our belief um, with our confidence, with our commitment, um, with our mentality. And so just trying to find ways to motivate, inspire uh, the, our, our collective mentality so that we have the best chance to manage the moments that we're in. So that's, that's the way I look at that. Yeah. Well, I'm Jesse. Um, Robin and Dan were telling us that Stu Dallas is back up and around the training ground as well, which is absolutely tremendous news. I was just wondering, you mentioned Luke Ayling and his leadership abilities, even though he's not going to be on the pitch. Same for Stuart towards the end of the season. But how do you use them to the best of the abilities, even though they're not on the pitch, to lead this side? Yeah, so I've already said the leadership council is, is Liam Cooper, Calvin Phillips, Luke Ayling, uh, Adam Forshaw, Rodrigo, Patrick Bamford, and Stuart Dallas. Five of those players have been injured. Right. So it's reduced our leadership core on the pitch to less and less and less. And I've challenged all those guys to be around the team, to have their finger on the pulse of what's happening with the group, to be positive, to 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 bring the kind of energy to our training ground every day to make sure that that everybody knows that in a difficult moment, we're good. We got this. Um, and then it also means their ability to, to invest and challenge some of the other players. And I went through, it could be Robin Cook. It could be Diego uh, Yoriente. It could be Rafinha. It could be Dan James. It could be Clicky. It could be a lot of the different guys that still have big experiences that can still provide their voice, their personality, their confidence into what we are right now. And then also to, to lead the younger guys, to, to help them to understand how to, how to be strong. So, my idea of leadership is not about just the person that is in this role. It's about the entire group uh, accessing their qualities and their, their abilities to be the best that they can be and the best versions of themselves in the most difficult times. And so that's where we are. I remember you talking uh, after Joe Gellhardt scored the winner against Norwich about the situation, what that was like for you and your family in the stands as well. What's this situation like for you personally and, and your family as well, given the stress that comes with Corona? I'm calm. I'm calm. You know, obviously, I'm f so focused on on exactly what we're doing here, right here, right now. But again, my vision is not was not from the beginning. wasn't twelve games. My vision is uh, over years, right? And obviously, the first step of my vision was staying in the Premiership because I believe this club deserves it. I believe this club has earned it, but we have to earn it in the moment right now. And, and so, of course, that's, that's all I think about, but stress doesn't help. <laughs> and I know that, you know, it's, that's the situation that we're in, but our ability to just remove that and continue to go forward in the ways that we want to and, and to eliminate all the pressures of, of, Whatever it is, you know, th this is why I love our fans in the stadium, because I think that they get it. And and they're the ones that I think when I see in the streets that are positive with me and when their energy in the crowd at Arsenal or or after the Man City game or 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 during the Norwich game or whatever. These are this is what what 
pushes us. This is what I think will help us achieve our goal in the next three games is these people who are positive, who are behind us, and they know how to express that every time we're in the stadium. So we're, we will use that on uh, tomorrow night for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, just on the kind of Ellen Road factor, I suppose, in the running, what do you expect, what do you demand from the supporters, especially tomorrow night against Chelsea? I, I, I don't expect or demand anything other than what I've already seen, which is love and positivity in, in that stadium at, the, at every moment to push us to where we want to go. I can promise to them that we're going to put a team on the pitch that is ready to go after it, that is aggressive, that plays with confidence, that, that represents the identity of what this fan base is. So I'm clear with that. Clearer now, I think, than I've ever been in the time that I've been here. And we will make sure that that when we put a match plan together, when we when we think about what we want to, how we want to play on match day, that that it represents those things. And just finally, for me, obviously, it's never a good time to play the European champions, I suppose. But is this a slightly better time than it ordinarily would be, given the FA Cup final of the weekend, given their unpredictability at the minute, Chelsea? Yeah, I can I can obviously see theoretically that it is a good time to play them. You know, that was also a talking point playing Man City in between Real Madrid uh, fixtures. A team like Chelsea, they've been through a lot this year. They've had an ownership change. They've had, um, you know, the on the back of winning the European Championship, it's never easy to to try to replicate th- that kind of success in the next season. And there's pressures that come with that. Um, they've had injuries. Uh, they've had a lot of fixture dates. They've had up and down form, and they have a big match on the weekend. So, but that that is a quality club with an equality manager, um, incredible players. They all know how to manage difficult situations. Who they bring, what their lineup is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We have to prepare for a team that is very very good that will come here and play their best, and we have to deliver our best. Thanks, yep. Jesse. Graham, how do you feel the players are standing up to the, the pressure and the stress? And what does staying strong look like on the pitch? Yeah, I think um, the players are doing well. You know, I mean, the, the, the moments after the disappointment in the last two games, um, it's obviously uh, it's important for me to manage that effectively. Right to stay positive with them, to to be encouraging with them, to let them know that this is again not just about one match or two matches or three matches. That that we continue to stay strong and that we fight until the very end and that we stay clear until the very end. And then it's about being aggressive against the ball, about wanting the ball on the pitch, about wanting to be in this moment, about knowing that we're good and that we're stronger together with our tactics, with our with our group mentality. Um, that those are the things that will ultimately reward us in the moment. So, you know, I, it, we've, I, I can say that the work on the pitch has gotten clearer and clearer and their understanding of our principles and what, how we want to play has gotten better every week, every day. And then it's about now in a stressful situation and then against very good opponents in the stadium to execute, right? And, and that's what it comes down to is the clarity of execution of what we want the game to look like. Mm -hmm. Can you give us examples of the video analysis you've shown the players from the last couple of games of what you do like and what you want them to repeat? So can you give us examples of that? I mean, listen, we have video analysis every day, and it's always about um, principles, match plans, roles. There's individual, there's small groups, there's, there's the group all together. In some ways, I've felt like the last three months I've been a video analyst more than a manager. <laughs> I'm tired of, my wife is tired of me sitting with my computer, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, it's important that I'm looking at every moment and, and now sorting through the details and communicating and translating exactly to the players what I think is important for them to understand what their roles are on, on match day. And to be fair, we have an intelligent group and they've tried in every way. And, um, yeah. I think the, the, they've, it's certainly not been perfect, but I think it has to do with everything involved. And I've been careful not to overwhelm them. And I've also been careful, as I've said along the process, to understand that it's not going to be perfect. And I've been careful to introduce less than more at the right times because I don't, I want them to still be free on match day to go and play, but to do it with discipline and clarity. So that balancing act for somebody who, who 
is very detail oriented. Um, and sometimes in the, a micromanager when it comes to these things is, is really that balance is important for me to understand and to get right. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do every day. Well, there was quite a bit of interest in the note that you gave to Dan James towards the end of the game on Sunday. What was on it and what was the, the purpose of it? So we, we just changed the, the, the tactical look. I, you know, the second half went almost exactly the way I wanted it to go, where we were tight, we made it difficult, we were dangerous on a couple transition moments, could we get a goal on a set piece? And then as the game went on, we could rearrange to be tactically more dangerous and see if in the last 5, 10, 15 minutes we could poach one more goal. Um, and we almost did that. So we just switched and played with Dan up top and played more 4-3-2 at the end of the match. And so that's what that was with a couple of instructions. So, um, you know, it, when you play, when we were playing in, um, the, the benefit of, of COVID was playing in empty stadiums. You could communicate with the, with the players more. I don't think the players like that. <laughs> I think they like li playing in front of fans and I think they like listening to their manager less. So, which is, it, which is the truth. Like, you know, game day isn't for managers. It's more for players. But just trying to to execute a plan, which I thought, again, the second half, if you if you say a man down and we played Arsenal and we won that half 1-0, uh, you'd say, well done. Well done. Thank you. Yep. Hey. Uh, Jesse, you spoke there about Rafinha. There's, there's been some speculation about his future. Is there danger that he might be distracted by that at this moment? Of the Not at all. Not at all. I, I see a person that is a hundred percent invested in what we're doing here. I mean, his emotion, which you, which, which someone already talked about, it can be interpreted as lack of discipline. I look at it as total investment, right? Is he wants more than anything to ensure that this club stays where it belongs. Um, so that that part for me has been no no talking point or thought at all so um he's 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 all in he's yeah. all in um, can i just say you you referred to the leadership council and the, the number of players you've had missing i think you know for half an hour on sunday you only had one of them on the field mm -hmm. so how important is it that is the challenge now for other players to stand up and show that they can be leaders yeah yeah well listen it's for me the job is individually to help each player to develop and grow and get better and then as a group to manage that uh, so that we're, we're that, that the individual projects add up to more as uh, in the group within the group project and that the sum of the parts is bigger than the whole. Right. And so, I mean, I could use a lot of examples um, of guys that I think in my time here have already grown massively. Um, so and that that's something that certainly in a difficult situation, I think, is makes me proud to see that the connection I've had with the team and with individuals and the way that they've responded and, and their growth has, has added up to, to um, making a difference. So that's, that's really my philosophy as a, as, a, as a football coach is trying to use the platform of football to help people develop and become bigger. Thank you. David? Um, which of the historical and Spartan figures do you look up to for leadership? So many, so many. Um, I mean, I, I've used Muhammad Ali a few times with the with the group. Um, Michael Jordan is a is a guy that I that I'm inspired by. Phil Jackson. Um, you know, I'd start dating myself if I went back to Vince Lombardi and Johnny Unitas. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot I, I've used also in the past. I've used the the 1998 uh, French. Football team. Um, I've used the the 2008 basketball road to redemption, the gold medal team in China. Um, you know, basketball. I, I, for me, I love basketball culture in America. It's it's phenomenal, and the, and the way that they combine inner city kids uh, with university graduates with uh, incredible mentors and in history of the sport um, is amazing. So. I use things that resonate with me that I think can also fit within the, the, the standing of where we are. And then there's also historical figures like, like Gandhi, like Mother Teresa, like um, presidents like JFK and, and different people along the way that, that I think um, 
have have meant something to to where we are historically in the world right now. So, yeah, I mean, I like to I like to read about those things. I like leadership books. I like history. I was a history major in university. So, but those are boring. That's those are boring conversations. Uh, <laughs> let's get back to okay. football. Thanks, everybody. We done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat>